Welcome everyone to another episode of Meet the Marketer. Today, I'm really excited because we have Eric Hatterscheidt here, direct from Canada. He <laughs> is far out west where he runs a resort. He's also a tour operator and he runs a podcast called Tourism Marketing Mastery and has developed a course by the same name. So he's a jack of all trades and I'm really excited to have you here today, Eric. Welcome. I'm excited as well, Mitch. I am honored to be here. Thanks for, for bringing me up. Great. Well, let's dive in. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in that intro. You're clearly someone who has his hands in all sorts of different pots. But let's start with just your introduction to the tourism industry. Where did that come from? What's your background? Uh, well, I'd say the intro started quite a few years ago because I grew up on a small remote resort in British Columbia, Canada. My parents, they moved there when I was nine years old. And pretty quickly, I went from being kind of this little suburban kid to a little child slave at the resort. And all of a sudden I was involved in every operation that there was uh, going on there. And initially, I'm not gonna lie to you, initially I kind of was a little bit resentful about the fact that I got thrown all these jobs at the resort. But as, as we were there over time, I started to understand that my impact on the resort, it, it mattered, that my involvement in the resort mattered. And so that eventually uh, turned into an interest in, in how do, how do I improve the actions, my actions, how does that improve the quality of life for my family? Cause it was a family run business. And so I was very invested from a pretty young age in, in tourism, specifically in that setting, but that's remained with me ever since then with this, this kind of real deep set interest in tourism with understanding, Hey, my actions today will actually influence my quality of life down the road. Um, and so I've studied that ever since. Um, I don't know how deep you want me to go into this, but I, I went to university, studied marketing and business at university and uh, took over the resort for a few years, built it up. Uh, we had some, some, well, I don't know. How, yeah. I don't know how much, how much do you want me to go into this? Listen, dive in, dive in. I can always <laughs> edit you. I can always edit you down later. Yeah. You might have to, cause this, who knows? I might I might drone on here, but if you want the full kind of backstory, was at the resort, um, graduated high school, went to university, studied business, with the intention of of coming back and having an impact on the resort. And what's a little bit of an irony is when I actually went back to the resort to help my family run it after I graduated university, everything I'd learned in a professional school setting in university, I tried applying that to the resort, specifically in the marketing um, arena, I guess. And that, that nearly broke us. Uh, everything I was trying was, it was pouring money down the drain, but we weren't seeing any return on investment with that. And it came to a low point where <laughs> to get really specific, I found myself one evening just crying into my beer um, as I was like, just understanding that my back was against a wall. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I felt like a complete fraud at the time as well, just because I had, all my friends knew I'd graduated university as a marketer. My family knew that the guests knew that. And I was absolutely failing miserably trying to market this thing. Nothing was working. And in that moment, when I kind of had this breakdown, it was at that point that I fully understood I had been learning from the wrong people. And the reason I say that is because everyone that I'd learned from in university, these were profs that had never run their own businesses. They never run a small business and none of them absolutely had run anything in tourism. And so that shifted my perspective to thinking, I need to learn from people that have done this successfully in this industry um, and know what it looks like to actually apply this to the real world. And so literally that moment after I had a good good ball um, on the couch <laughs> with my beer in front of me, I, uh, I actually got up, went over to my computer and started doing some research on resorts um, and tour companies around the world. And just did a reach out to managers. And over the next month, I just pestered these managers, um, hoping that somebody would talk to me and let me know what they were doing. And a lot of people just totally rejected me, but there was there was a number of businesses around the world that for whatever reason, they took some pity on me and, and we had conversations. And that was my real intro to the path that actually made a difference for us over the last decade is learning from people that have actually done um, what we're trying to do as opposed to those that are, are speaking theory. And so for myself, um, quite a few years later, when I started actually teaching some of this stuff, I wanted to make sure I was teaching from a point of having done it and not of theory, because the theory was something that was, was such a, a heartache for me to learn 
four years of university and find out that none of it applied. I didn't want to have anyone else go through that. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone didn't catch that, this is not an, a blurb for marketing programs in universities. Uh, <laughs> I, I love it though. I love the boots on the ground style learning that you did and also the way in which you grew up really experiencing tourism as a, as even as a kid. Now, I know there's, we'll get back to the resort, but I know there's another side of you, which is also as a more traditional tour operator of motorcycle journeys. Could you actually also tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that was a very interesting endeavor that we never really planned to jump into. This wasn't a, okay, we're going to start a tour company. And actually, I should, I, I'll take that back. We did say we're going to go, let's, let's look at the concept of starting a tour company on the side. And in that journey of trying to start this like motorcycle tour company on the side, which came out of, uh, it's one of those, those classic tales of a friend and I went on a motorcycle trip through Guatemala and we thought that was amazing. Wouldn't it be incredible if we could get paid to do that? Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't really intention to turn that into like, oh, okay, this is going to be a full-time job. We already had full-time jobs. It was just the concept of who knows, maybe, maybe some other guys want to do this once a year and we can, we can go on a journey together. When we tried to market it traditionally as a motorcycle tour company, partly just because I didn't have the time and focus to, to put into marketing that, um, I just kind of went with by the book marketing and we gained a little bit of interest, but not enough to justify continuing to, to put time and effort into it until um, about six months down the road when we kind of given up on, on even getting it off the ground because neither of us had the time to do it. Uh, I read a book called Expert Secrets by Russell Brunson, and he talked about the concept of starting a movement in that book. And so we took some of the principles of how you start a movement and we applied it to, um, to that business because we had nothing to lose. It pretty much, it, it didn't exist. So we just applied it to that, that business. And that was a very important seed that we planted that, that grew that, that business to the point where prior to COVID, um, we had more applications coming in for that than we could actually field. And we were having to filter out a number of quite a, quite a few, um, applicants from those trips just because we couldn't take them all in. And it's still technically a side business for us, but it's kind of rapidly turning into something where now we're hiring teams and people to take care of that thing because it's, uh, it's growing relatively well. And I, I believe it's because of this kind of spin approach that we put on it that most, most tour companies uh, don't really look at their, their tour business through that lens. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting and for both businesses, for the resort and the tour company, it's been a matter of feeling okay with using those companies kind of as a, as a guinea pig in, in both settings where I don't, I don't feel like I've got a ton um, to lose, which I, hopefully doesn't come across as too arrogant because I know, you know, most people listening to this, their company is, that's it. Um, that is their, they're going to, that's their bread and butter. That's what puts food on the table. Uh, for me, I always had another business that was kind of doing that. So I had the good fortune of trying different things here and there, and some things worked and some things didn't. But the things that worked, uh, what I want to do is I want to share that with other tour operators. And so that's where the podcast comes in and the course comes in is, hey, let me share with you what what most people aren't doing, but is working really well for us because we borrowed it either from another industry or we innovated by, by putting things together from different uh, businesses that we've we've seen. Uh, where this this marketing stuff can work. So I met you first as a guest on your podcast, Tourism Marketing Mastery, and it has uh, grown to become a fantastic success. You have, I think, listeners in over a hundred countries, if I remember you telling me that. Uh, and that's that's great. Was was that a COVID project? What was the impetus behind uh, putting sort of what you've learned into these discussions and into these episodes? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. So one thing I haven't touched on, I've kind of danced around or alluded to is um, once I've kind of like, I, I went, I ran the, my parents' resort or the family resort for a few years. Um, in that time, after I'd actually started learning from people that were doing what I wanted to do, that took the resort in the course of a year, essentially, it over doubled our revenue. Um, and I think we tripled our profits in that first year just by listening to other people and what they had to say that had worked for them. And so I kind of continued on that, on that, um, 
trend for a few years with the resort. We continued to grow. Um, we were able to put managers and staff in place. And there came a point, this is still when I'm in my early 20s, there came a point where uh, I wanted to go and do something else. And so I ended up leaving the resort uh, officially. I've always been kind of the main marketing guy for the resort, but officially I left like being on site because it was a remote resort. I'm in my young, I'm in my early twenties. And <laughs> as, as a lot of guys in their early twenties, I'm like, Hey, I want to hang out with friends. And, um, it was really tough to find any kind of girlfriend at the time because I'm living in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. So, uh, that was, that was my driver was this, the social aspect. So from there, I kind of sat down and I said, what would my next business look like? And I pinned it out on a piece of paper. And to me, that was going to be a more remote style business. Um, and I ended up going in and from there partnering up with a couple of guys and going into an online business where we ran like an international business uh, with recruiting, hiring, training, virtual assistants, and then pairing them up with uh, larger corporate companies around the world. Did that for a few years, applied a lot of the marketing uh, to that. And through that, uh, a lot of our clients were asking us how we were growing so fast. And so it just became organic conversations with our clients explaining, hey, we grew this thing and here's how we're doing it. And that was essentially consulting calls. And I didn't even think about it like that at the time, but it was marketing consulting calls. And I started getting more and more of those calls. And that evolved into me realizing like, oh, I actually enjoy this consulting thing um, more than running the company. So uh, after a few years, I sold out my shares in that company to my partners and delved into consulting. So for the last five years, I've exclusively been doing marketing consulting. And that marketing consulting gave me the opportunity. So over the last five years, um, worked with a business that was, it was, uh, it was well received. Let's put it that way. So over the last five years, it grew over time, but if I averaged it out, we, we worked with a, an average, probably of around 500 businesses a year. And so that puts us in a situation where just as a result of that situation, I've had the opportunity to look at and work with uh, over 2,500 businesses across hundreds of industries and see what's working and what's not. And all of those businesses we worked with for a year or more. So we'd see longer term, um, what were the implications of some of the, the marketing strategies that we were introducing. And then as I learned which strategies were working really well in different industries, I was able to take that information and come back to my, my tourism based businesses and use them as guinea pigs and say, hey, I've seen this work really well in a number of different scenarios, a number of different industries. Let's bring that concept back and try it here. And I'm okay with trying it here because the consulting business was doing well enough that if for whatever reason something happened to the resort or the motorcycle company, it would be okay. Financially, I'd be okay. Um, so I was willing to take a few risks. And then I thought, <laughs> this is a long-winded answer to your question, but the but the the initial thought was I have a unique opportunity that most tour operators don't have um, in order to take big risks and also to take all of these, these data points and bring them back to my business. This is information that I would absolutely have killed to have when I was first starting off. I want to share this with the world. So I just decided to turn that into free information and that became the podcast. And then from the podcast, um, people were asking like, Hey, is there any kind of course that you have? And so that's where I developed, um, developed the, the course, uh, which is just trying to share our approach to marketing, which is, is a little bit different than there's, there's definitely some principles in there that are core to marketing, but then there's a number of things in there that are different than what a lot of other tour operators would think to do. Uh, amazing. So I feel like we could spend the next three hours talking about those differences and uh, everything, but that's what the course is for. I'm interested in you just sharing a little bit of some of the commonalities of the problems of these businesses from a marketing standpoint that you've sort of seen over the years of working with 2,500 different businesses. Are there themes that developed in terms of how these these smaller operators or, or other businesses are, are starting out in mistakes or trends? A, that's a really, that's a loaded question. And the reason I'm going to say that is because what I've observed over time is that it really depends at what stage you're at in the business. So if you're just starting off, your, your problems are going to be often quite different than you are a, maybe a year or two down the road from that versus what they are when you're running a, an operation that's established and you have staff, um, so 
I mean, almost the, the best analogy I can give to this is the way that I see marketing strategy or business strategy is a lot like chess where someone asks you like, okay, what, what's the set of moves that you need to make in order to win? And I'm like, Hey, we can coach you on, on those moves, but we need to know your exact scenario. So if we're going to try and blanket statement, teach everyone chess at the same time, um, sure. There's a core things, a few core things that we can teach. And that's what we're trying to do in, in the course. But at the same time, we need to look at your individual scenario and say, where are you at in the game? Because that will dictate your next move. That's probably not the answer you're looking for. I, I'd say if you're looking to understand what are a few core things that we see at different stages. Early on, one of the biggest things, quite frankly, is initially is, is just mindset. Um, just where are they at mentally? What are they? What's what's the what are the, the self-imposed challenges that they have um, about their own understanding of, of how they're going to reach what their level of success is? So uh, that's often some of the first things that we work through is, hey, here's the journey you're going to go on. These are things you're going to encounter. Uh, here's Here are ways of working through some of these challenges that you're inevitably going to encounter if you're first starting off. And that was something that took me a while to learn in consulting world. I always thought if you just have the information, that's all you need and you're good to go. But what I saw consistently coming up over time was that, no, it's actually the fortitude to, to push through. If you were to ask me, what's the one consistent that I saw with companies that, that were our, our stars that really kind of put their, put their sights on a certain goal and made that happen. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was great. Angela Duckworth talks about this um, in her book and also in a TED talk, but it's just saying, I'm going to get there no matter what. So hell or high water, if there's a wall put in front of me, I will find a way around it as opposed to throwing your hands up and saying, I can't do it. Um, I don't know what to do next. It's, it's the entrepreneurial mind saying, I will find a way around this. And it's just that coming up and up uh, again and again and again. So and, and it's just executing. It's putting that stuff into action. I know that sounds like an old cliche, but we worked with a mechanic once early on. And that mechanic, when we first came to him, I think he was doing $150,000 a year in revenue. And at the end of the first year working with him, he was doing, he did, I think, 1.2 in 1.2 million in revenue. And at the end of the year, we were sitting in a group with a number of the other business owners that we're consulting with. And we said, what do you think led to your growth? And before he could even answer, one of the other businesses that we were consulting with were like, I can answer that question. Um, Chris, Chris is his name. He's, he's like, Chris wouldn't, wouldn't wait to execute on something. As soon as you gave him a task to do, he would just go and do it. And he might be doing it wrong, but he, nonetheless, he was doing it. And even doing it wrong put him on the path to learning how to do it better. And it was just the mm -hmm. fact that he implemented all these things throughout the year that led to massive success in his business. And he just, he was okay with not doing it right. Um, and so that's, that's a major pattern for sure. A huge thing, I don't know, like, I'm not, I know we could go on for hours about this. I think the one other thing that I'll really kind of concentrate on here is a lot of people think that marketing is this external thing. Okay. Go out and shout to the world what you've got before that even happens. Marketing, in my opinion, needs to start internally. So it starts almost with you selling to yourself that the thing I've got is amazing. Um, and if you don't truly feel that, then we need to actually, we need to make sure that that experience is amazing, the experience that you're providing. And that's a good chunk of what this course actually goes into is how do you provide amazing experiences? I had a fantastic mentor. I shouldn't even say had, still still have a relationship with him, but there's a guy named Justin King who was a luxury um, resort manager down in, uh, well, he was in Tasmania and I was running a, a high-end luxury resort in Fiji. And he taught me probably one of the most incredible things I ever learned about experience and creating experience. And he calls it the plus one method. And so I teach that in the course as well. But you need to look at what's your unique factor in action. Before you go out and blast things to the world, we really need to look at what is this business actually doing and what is it you're creating as a unique experience. That is one of the largest downfalls I've seen traveling internationally. Um, it shocks me how often you'll go and you'll find these tour businesses and they, for lack of <laughs> lack of a better word, they're just copying the person next door because they can see there's a market there and they're all doing the same thing. And so 
the businesses I've seen succeed for sure are the ones that are not afraid to say, that's great. I'll take a method that's working, but I need to put my unique spin on it. And then that's what sets them apart and, and really is able to bring them a, a majority of the market share that's coming into that, that area. So that's a, that's a long, again, another long winded answer to your question, but. No, it's, it's great because it hits all of the important things, which is, when, when you say mentality, I was so resonating with that because, I mean, we work with early stage tour operators and a lot of what the journey is for them is an emotional journey. It's wrapped up in putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, giving yourself a pass as you screw up. But also, you're so right. It's it's staying on track, staying motivated and actually executing, even knowing that what you've done is probably going to change or be thrown out the window and five years or five minutes or five months, but it doesn't matter. It's just start going. And I've, I've watched the way in which personality and those mental habits factor so much into the business success that you have, regardless of the quality of your tour product idea. You know, you're a tinkerer and I know you're a social media guy, of course. Uh, is do people fall into the same kind of herd mentality in social media marketing? Do you, what do you advise on that level? Do you advise tinkering, <laughs> thinking outside the box? I know you mentioned Bronson, who's kind of a legend in developing new techniques for interacting on Instagram or Facebook. And so what are your, what are your thoughts or philosophies on how operators should be thinking about that beast of a, of a topic? It's a really good question. Um, I think the first thing that's important to mention of, of all the, the businesses I've worked with, I think the thing a lot of social media marketers miss out on is the fact that they're working with small business owners who don't have the time, capacity, resources to put a ton of effort into social media um, because they're operating a business. And in most cases, unless you've got to a point where you've got a team running the business and you've managed to step out to some degree, you're it. You're the person that's doing everything. So it's, it's, I fully resonate with the fact that it's a challenge and it's something that most operators don't want to do. There's a few young operators that are, they kind of grown up in that world. And so that's something that they're used to, and it becomes a natural extension of them. But for most operators out there, that's still not the case. So what we try and do is we try and show how are we actually bringing, uh, bringing business in through the social media accounts in a very limited or with a very limited, um, capacity to do so. And one thing that, again, that kind of comes up in the course is when I teach and talk about social media, if you looked at our social media accounts, there'd probably be a lot of wondering what was going on because we only post, and I shouldn't, I'm not even advocating this, but we're making it work. At this point, we're only posting like once, maybe once a month um, with our, our social media. And we're still bringing in bookings from that. Ultimately, I think what people need to understand is that the goal is actually not to build a following on social media. That is a step in the process to building your contact list. And then once you've got a really strong contact list, that can be the core driver and it's much, much more efficient to engage and interact with your contact list um, than it is to continually keep pushing social media. So. There's a number of things that are counterintuitive when we're teaching our, our version of social media. Um, we don't say post all the time. Uh, we will often, or we do say quality is, is more important to us than quantity. Uh, so as opposed to posting every day, like for us, like I said, we might only post once a month. Um, I would argue that we probably should be posting more than that, but <laughs> it's because, and it's because of the stage we're at. So because we've built up some very, very strong lists, um, there's a point when that list almost starts to self-regenerating because people are talking about what you've got and referrals are coming in. And there's a point where you don't have to have social media anymore. And we're okay with that because the realization that we have is every social media channel out there will eventually disappear or it's going to lose the effectiveness that it has when it first comes out as free. So for instance, um, we built up with one of our businesses, we built up over 30,000 followers on Facebook. And now if we put out a, an organic post, it reaches like 2% of that audience. And so now we have to pay for it. So regardless, we'd be either we have to put an ad out or we have to boost a post to our own audience. 
And we realized pretty early on, this is going to happen with every platform we're on. We built up for the motorcycle club. We've got, I believe 35,000 followers on Instagram and that's where it really got us going, but that's not the core driver necessarily anymore. Now the core driver is the actual contact list and reaching out to them and, and getting referrals from that. So ultimately you need to understand what's the real strategy here. Is it just to build up a following on Facebook or get exposure for the day? That's not it. The real strategy is you need to build, you do need to build a strong relationship with that audience, but you need to make sure that you are capturing their contact information as you're doing that. Um, because it will allow you to get to a point where all you have to do is reach out to that list and you could effectively, it's possible. Let me put it this way. It's possible to book out your entire season with one email. And that might sound for a lot of tour operators that might sound like there's no way. Um, but I can tell you with confidence, we've done it. We, we literally did it a week ago. Um, we've done it before with the motorcycle club and we did it a week ago. Again, with the resort, we sent out an email, we booked out our entire season, um, with one email in a few hours, but that was as a result of years of working on this as a strategy. So, um, yeah, don't, it's not about just post a picture every day. That's, that's not it. You have to know kind of bigger picture what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that's liberating in some ways. Cause actually often it means that you have to put less effort into it when you really understand what the strategy is. That's uh, that's phenomenal. I mean, I know there's going to be a lot of questions probably going through people's heads right now about what was in that email that booked you out for the season uh, in in one go. Did Were you building anticipation? Did people know that there was a, a release of, of open rooms? I mean, what uh, what was your philosophy behind behind that style of, of selling? Yeah, so that's a really good question. This is something, again, we address in the course that I don't know that anyone else in tourism is doing, but we have a concept that we've kind of been, we've been testing and tinkering with over the last few years that we call the booking launch. And what we did, and I borrowed this strategy, like all of these things that I'm doing, these are, these are for the most part, this is stuff that I'm just watching other businesses execute on and execute on well. And I say, how could we possibly bring that from another industry into our business? And so the example I'm going to give here is watching initially Apple do their keynote. Um, and then Tesla kind of borrowed that strategy and has done it really well, but it's a matter of building this anticipation for new new uh, experiences that you're bringing into your operation, whether it's on the resort or the, or the tour company for us, it's, it's looking at both and saying, Hey, what are some new things that we're bringing into this? But as opposed to just putting it out there, let's say on social media or through email blast, we allude to it. We hint at it throughout the year. And there's only one time a year where we actually have our, our version of a keynote where we're like, okay, great. All these things that we've kind of been hinting at that we're like, Hey, pay attention because on whatever on uh, yeah, on December 10th, like, I mean, you pick your whatever date, but on December 10th, um, we're going to be launching like our, our version of a keynote. Like we're going to be sharing with you all these things we've been working on all year. And then that day that you give the keynote is the same day that you open up for bookings. Now, this is as a result also on our side, this is as a result of actually withholding the ability to book. And that was a big risk for us. This is one really, really key instance where this was probably the biggest risk we ever took on the guinea pig side of where I had to go to my parents and say, hey guys, I have this idea. Let's not let anyone book for essentially, well, at that point it was like six months. So we're like, let's not any, let anyone book for six months. Um, and we're gonna withhold all those people, put them on a waiting list, push them to the keynote. And then once the keynote, once we do it, then we can open up the, the doors to book. And of course my parents were like, that sounds like a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> however, I had shown, I had, I was like, listen, if it doesn't work, our backup plan is basically to go back to ad spend. And I'd gotten pretty decent just through split testing ads of filling up the, the resort. So I was like, if it doesn't work, I will find ad spend. I'll still fill it. Just let's experiment with it. Um, so they begrudgingly agreed. And, uh, that first year that we did that was last year. Yeah. Last year. And I talk about this in the podcast and that, that first year we really kind of built up lists and, and built up this booking launch. And that first year it took us like, we sent out the emails, um, we did the, or we sent out the emails, we did the launch and I believe we booked out, I'm trying to remember my exact figures. I believe it was 
if I'm going exact, I think it was 87%. Don't quote me on that. Cause I think I actually have it in the course somewhere like 85, 87%, something like that booked up in the first, first few days. And then it took us another two weeks to book out the rest. Um, and then we continue kind of building this list, building anticipation. It's getting your audience used to the fact that this is the way you're going to operate. And then when we did it this year, we booked out our season in three hours. So, um, it's, it's something that it's a strategy that is a long-term strategy. And that's another thing when I'm looking at the way that we do marketing, a lot of people are not necessarily going to love the way that I teach the course, because there's a few things where I'm like, here's your short-term win. And we can get that through ads. Chris Torres actually was, is probably, he's a great resource for getting short-term wins. And I agree with everything he's saying on the ad side, but I'm thinking about this more as long-term strategy. What's this going to look like in two years? What's this going to look like in five years? And ultimately, what's this going to look like in 20 years? In the course, I talk about how do you make sure you're marketing to the children that are coming in if you have families so that they want to bring their kids back? I'm, I'm, I'm mm. going that far in advance and saying, what, what's the play there? Um, so I'm probably getting away from, the, from your original question. I go on these long-winded answers. but um, no, I mean, I think it's all great because I think it shows that you're looking at the bigger picture and you're thinking outside of the boxes that we all tend to put ourselves in in this industry because you're right. If anyone's ever tried to get Beyonce tickets off of Ticketmaster or buy the new iPhone, they're used to what it feels like to, to, to experience a keynote, a pre-launch, a limited, limited availability. You better be clicking refresh on your screen so you can get in and book that up. And it's really fascinating to uh, see the way you've uh, applied that. And uh, so the podcast is called Tourism Marketing Mastery, which is also the name of the course. And uh, you've uh, very graciously agreed to uh, offer that to operators during this uh, difficult time on Campfire as just a resource to have. Uh, just in the final uh, minute, what can they expect uh, uh, in the context of that course? What's what's the experience like of going through this uh, unorthodox road with you? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the one thing I really wanted to make sure with this course was that I wasn't giving information that wasn't going to be useful. So what I did is I took a solid two months uh, out of my schedule, time, time blocks out of my schedule, and I reached out to both uh, resorts and tour operators to ask them, what are the biggest challenges you have around marketing? And, uh, 50 plus conversations later, I took all of those, those challenges, uh, and frustrations about marketing. And I actually took those, looked for what are the core patterns that, that, uh, all these, these tour operators or tourism based operators are facing as challenges. And I will address each one of those questions as a module in the course to try and make sure that I was, I was, hitting the real needs in the market. So when you're going through this course, uh, I would say it is useful to go through whether you're just starting off or whether you've been in this industry for 20 plus years. Like I'm teaching stuff that has applied to our resort. We didn't start doing this until we were already, I think 18 years into, into our process. And it still was a massive game changer for us. The only thing that is a difference maker for you if you're just starting out is the fact that you don't have to do all the trial and error that we did. Uh, we're trying to set you off on the right foot. So in the beginning, a lot of it is going to be a little bit more um, thinking about the bigger picture strategy and that ties into branding. And when I talk about branding, it's not here's a logo. To me, branding is what's the culture of this business that you're building um, and how does that internal culture seep into the outside world and, and people understand who you are and how you operate. And then from there, it launches into a number of other um, kind of start with starting with principles. We're looking at um, key factors that made big differences for us were things like, hey, how do you set up? How do you set up your website? Another big one is copywriting. What's and copywriting? <laughs> if you know what, if you're not familiar with the term copywriting, I wouldn't feel guilty because even in university, I still wasn't sure on what copywriting was. I thought it was the legal version of copywriting. Turns out there's a whole nother version of copywriting that has to do with marketing sales, having a conversation in the written word that convinces someone to, to take action. Um, so there's a segment on copywriting. What are you actually saying in, on your, on your website or in your ads? Um, to that note, there's also, there's a whole section on ads, um, how to create simple ads, primarily in Facebook, Instagram. Um, looking at also efficiencies. How do you take a lot of these, these things that you need to do? And what are some of the, the softwares that are out there that can actually save you a ton of time? 
for instance, building that contact list, how do you do that? What are the softwares you need to do that? Because now we have that automated. I don't need to do anything. That contact mm -hmm. list just continues to grow and grow and grow. Um, so how do you make that an automated process where you're essentially a few, like a few hours, sometimes it depends how much time you're putting into it, but a few hours to a few days of work in the long run can equate to hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue with very little effort down the road. So it's just a different way of thinking about, about, yeah, where's the revenue coming from? You constantly have to keep reaching out, slaving away to, to bring people in the door and then look for a whole new batch, or um, are you setting this up in a way that's automated? So looking at that, um, there's, I'm sure there's a million things I'm missing on here. Some of it is the booking launch strategy. So how do we formulate this whole booking launch thing? Um, and then part of it also absolutely plays into social media. What are we, what are we doing for social media, which is not, not the same approach that a lot of other people are using for social media, but it's working for us. Um, we still are booking a few hundred thousand through social media without paid ads. So what does that look like? Cool. Great. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a lot of working smarter, working better, uh, and investing your time in, in some good strategies that are going to pay off in the long run of your tour business. Eric, a huge thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, let our community meet you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, and your face and your voice again in the course. Thanks, Eric. My pleasure, Mitch. Thanks for having me on.